Hey, how you doing? It's Clayton here from HowToDrawComics.net, and welcome to today's Creator Spotlight. On the show, we are welpen- welcoming none other than Eric Canetti, an incredibly talented artist who is currently working on his own comic book, and he is going to be sharing with us some killer drawing tips, tricks, and techniques, talking a little bit about his method and also how he thinks about his approach when he's working on a comic book page, which you can see here in front of you. Uh, I mean, how lucky are we that it just so happens you're working on an actual comic book today on the stream in front of us, Eric. Thank hey, you so much for, for being me. here, man. No, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. I, we were talking, uh, you know, offline a bit about how I'm being very uh, opportunistic about being able to talk to you, but also stay on my production schedule when it comes to these pages. For So thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, just so everybody knows, because we were also talking about this before the stream, what does your production schedule actually look like? Because... I yeah. Guess, after hearing a man, you're you're a hustler, and I've got great respect for that. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm up by I'm up by four a.m. Uh, maybe if I let myself kind of like, you know, be lazy, I'm up by four thirty. Then I'm down in the office uh, by five o'clock. Breakfast is done by five thirty, and I'm on and I'm working. I've got my whatever whatever YouTube thing I'm watching, whatever movie that I'm watching, and I'm working from five thirty until about nine then it becomes family time and then i'm back into the office working remotely for nine to five and then by five o'clock i go back to to do family time until about 7 7 30 p.m that's around right after dinner and then i'm working again until about 10 o'clock 11 o'clock and then i fall asleep do the next thing do it again until that's monday through friday i take weekends for myself wow that's cool You were telling us how many pages you can smash out in a day. Right? Yeah, you know, that's misleading. You know, like that sounds really super cool, but it's not as cool as it looks. Like it's, I've seen the kind of pages that you guys do on this channel and they are like pinpoint, like laser, laser printed type, you know? And I don't do that. Like you, you're looking at the, can you guys see the my screen right now? Is it up on? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, we can see it's it. It's the loosest thing in the world, but because I know my shorthand, I kind of don't need to be super duper like, you know, um, um, accurate about it. And there's things that I know that I'll end up solving uh, when I'm when I'm inking. There's so many elements on here already. And I'm like, oh, I know, I know how, how I'll do that. So uh, to, to answer your question, Rob, it's like three pages a day, but it, it's, it's not as impressive as it sounds. You know, it's like three pages of like the loosest pages you've ever seen. I don't know, man. That sounds pretty impressive, no matter which way you spin it. Uh, in chat, please take this uh, stream, share it out on social media, on Twitter, on Facebook. We want to get as many people in here to watch Eric work as possible. Uh, mm-hmm. and we- hey, I've got to say, big thanks to Rob for organizing this treat. Yeah, because thank you so much, Rob. He Jeez. reached out to Eric, uh, got him on the stream here, and uh, and somewhat befriended him before uh before we we were given the pleasure to actually uh see him here today so uh rob always bringing on the big guests <laughs> but yeah. Eric's, he's a really nice dude man he's like you know like you, you, with big artists sometimes you don't know what you're gonna get and he he's just a genuinely nice dude he's interested uh in lots of different things i think from what i can i can tell he wants to understand how things work and mm-hmm. you know yeah, I think the first, I don't know what led me down to, what was it? The history was I'd run into Kozor somehow. I wish I knew so I could at least give that individual, if it was a situation, if it was an individual credit. But oh, wow. I I went to that campaign, back that, and just somehow I ended up in, was it was it awareness, if not directly the hype for a Replicator? I can't remember. And then so... You know, and, and and I tuned in for this channel, and at one point, you guys ended up talking about the the crowdfunding portion of your guys's campaigns, right? And I'm like, oh, I want to know as much about that as possible. And the thing that really drew me into it, because first of all, your guys' um, relationships with each other is pretty awesome. Like you, you guys bust each other's balls all the time, which is like really, really cool. That level of comfortability with a group of people is, I, I think, unique, and you can tell when it's genuine. You know, yeah. so like, hey, these guys are fun to watch. They're fun to listen to. 
And so while I was on Twitter, I just, uh, what was it, Rob? I think I may have reached out to you and said, hey, man, you know, what's uh, what's the deal with this crowdfunding? How's that going? Right? It was something that simple, no? Yeah, it was something like that. You, you said something along the lines, I really like your crowdfunding document. Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah, Which is invaluable. I don't know how many people have access to that, but or how many people in chat are aware of it and more more importantly have access to it. But if you have any sort of inclinations for crowdfunding, I think not to say that the, the document will the end all is the end all be all, but certainly it gives so much good, condensed, concise information. And it's it's mm. worth to really just read through. That's a that's amazing, Rob. Cheers. I appreciate that, man. Appreciate it. Um, let's say hello to chat quickly, Clayton. Uh, sure. We've got some people popping in here. We've got Badger. Uh, welcome again, mate. Uh, Hockey. Uh, Xerix86. I don't know if you're new, but if you are, welcome. Uh, Ballandor. Johnny oh. Cage. Sheldon Martin. Um, and, and that's that's it. But, yeah, numbers are, are getting up, so that's good. Everyone, thank you. Share, share out the stream, please. I borrow ideas, Mo Biggs. Welcome, welcome. So, Eric, what application are you working in here? Because, of course, you work digitally, which is pretty yeah. cool. What that yeah. means for us is that it's it's so easy to look over your shoulder as you're working and you're, you're sharing your screen with us. We can see exactly what you're doing here. Yeah. Um, so, this is Procreate. Initially, ooh. I didn't have... Um, I'll tell you this, my biasness against digital was like super aggressive. I didn't mm -hmm. like the idea of doing comic book pages digitally because I'm an old fart. You know, you guys seem like young dudes, you know what I mean? But for me, I'm like, I'm ancient, you know? Uh, so the idea of doing anything digital was like, ah, that's, that doesn't have, that doesn't have any appeal to me whatsoever. I, ever, I would hold up all the things that makes, you know, all the arguments that people who work traditionally who have biases against digital, they would say like, oh, there's no aftermarket sale for the original pages, pages, yada, all the arguments for it. And then one year, I think it was when Kyle Webster released all of his brush shots for Photoshop. And I was like, pfft. And I tried it and I was like, holy crap, look at this thing. <laughs> it does everything that I want to, um, at least on a, on a desktop with my, with my Wacom. Mm -hmm. And the first time that I ever tried it, I was like, let's see if this even looks anything like my traditional work. And I, um, I did the first page of Chrononauts with, it, it, I don't know if you know the book, but it was a book that um, Mark Millar wrote. Um, yep. And so I did the first page of that book in, in digital, first two pages, I think. And I sent it to my friend and I said, what do you think? And he's like, looks great. How many more are you of these are you going to do? And I'm like, probably the entire book just like this. And he's like, what do you mean? And I said, oh, it's all digital. And he's like, get the, get the hell out of here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, good. If I, can, if I can pull one over on John, then this is a good place to go. And so... That's what kind of turned me around because not only, not only was it, or actually the primary reason is because when you have, as you know, Clayton, you just you you're, you have a brand new family, right? When yep. you have to worry about them, you want to optimize as much time behind the desk as possible, right? Absolutely. And digital helps to facilitate any and all of that, not just in the actual drawing, but the delivery as well. Right. Mm -hmm. If if it's all digital, it's a file and I can just as easily upload it from the time that I put down my last line and change the file name so that, that the naming culture is is sort of like consistent, upload mm -hmm. it and it's done. Right. Traditional, I'd have to stop, put it on the scanner, scan it on Photoshop, get rid of as much of the gray or blue line, mine is blue. Right. Optimize mm -hmm. for the black. Right. Save that. Upload that somehow. And all those extra steps that may not seem like it's a lot, but it adds up in the end. Right. And if the biggest yeah. commodity that we have is time, that one was a smart move to go. Um, yeah. 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 There's a, there's a lot of pr a process when it comes to working traditionally. And I remember because I haven't really worked traditionally and taken the scan the artwork taking it into photoshop in preparation oh for coloring yeah um f since i was going to high school so oh, i'm very thankful Have that i caught on to the the digital craze uh that artists were experiencing very early on yeah and 
I remember the reason why. It was because I was seeing these other amazing artists pull off these incredible feats. Yeah. Like their work was just mind blowing. And I felt like if I wanted to do work like that, I'd have to learn how to become a digital artist as well. Oh, sure. Sure. Uh, and back then it was more concept art type stuff. They were doing these right. immaculate digital paintings. Right. And and that's how I got onto it. But uh, unlike your experience, it was really uncomfortable for me at first. I was like, I did not like this at all. And I actually put down the tablet for a little while before picking it up again and just biting the bullet because uh, there was just no way around it for me at some point. But yeah. I think that it's really great when you can capture a traditional looking aesthetic and appeal to your digital work because that's something right. that's most of us worry about if we're traditional artists is being able to replicate that in a digital format. Um, For sure. It was, did For that sure. come fairly naturally to you or did you have to make a few tweaks? And It's two and parts. It's two parts. One is that the brushes came pretty close, but also a lot of it is the psychology behind digital mm -hmm. art. What people, the threshold that prevents people the delta that, that prevents people from crossing into full digital art is that it doesn't exactly emulate the line that they do with pen and ink. Yeah. As soon as you drop that, as soon as you say, well, it's not going to, suddenly it just liberates you from all the expectations of that. Does that make sense? So the okay. moment you, if, if you're hung up on, oh, this doesn't look like a traditional ink and pen, pen line, well, it's not. So why, what are you asking of it? You know, so instead I had to shift my brain into, okay, this is not going to look like that, but is there something that can get close? And more importantly, something that can get close that I'm happy with. And as soon as I found that it made it working on digital so much easier. And so from the Wacom that was sort of like, um, you know, uh, I'm chained to my desk now moving into the iPad full time and working on procreate, right? Uh, that that took a little bit of transition time. It's like, okay, so that was all Photoshop. Those were all Photoshop brushes. And then Procreate said, by the way, you can take all your Photoshop brushes and plug it into this program. I'm like, oh, I never I had to sit that. at this. I never had to sit at this desk anymore. You know, I can be at the kitchen table. I can be in my in-laws place, you know, just anywhere that I need to work. Right. Yeah. And do you take, which is both good and bad. Right. Yeah. I'm sorry. I cut you off, and, man. What were you saying? And do you take full advantage of that? Like you really do sit down at the kitchen table or whenever you have a spare moment and try to knock out another panel? Yes, and I shouldn't. Because yeah. if I've learned anything from being much younger, which is like my 20s, like working all the time is amazing and it feels good and you feel like you've accomplished a lot, but you fast forward to your 30s and your 40s and you really need to actively separate your you, you really need to establish a home life balance. You know, I mean, it's a mm -hmm. work life balance, right? Like, okay. Because this allows me to go into the living room and work there, I have to be that much more diligent about not doing that, right? Because it takes okay. away the, the enjoyment of not being in this room for however many hours a day. Yeah. yeah. And I guess you, you uh, don't appreciate being at the drawing board, so to speak, as much as well you don't get that chance to really miss it, which I think is important I sometimes. Agree. I agree. Yeah, I, I get, I mean, you know, truth be told, I'm sometimes out there thinking about the thing that I need to draw next, but mm -hmm. at least I'm out there as opposed to just in here, just looking for, you know, like not getting an opportunity to step away. That and I'm old and I can't be like, hunched over this desk for more than three hours at a time. You don't look that old, man. Uh, you know, I know you keep bringing it up, but you don't look that old. You, you're am, aging I'm well. Like, what am I? It's, I mean, I, I, you know, I made a deal with a particular devil to say like, keep me this young until I'm done with this book. And then it all just cascades down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> cool. Um, Maybe you'll age rapidly over the course of the book. That's what's going to happen. I suspect. Eric, what is this book that you're working on and what's the plans for it? Yeah. So, um, the book that uh, it's called Arcathena and it is my love letter to sort of like, Chris Claremont, Jim Lee, X Men comics. I, I jokingly, this was easily five years ago. I had read, I, I've been out of comics, at least mainstream comics, for a long time, because they just, you know, I don't know if it's the same for you guys, but it just runs its course. It ran its course for me, 
um, like, oh, I've read this story before and I don't know if I want to continue reading an iteration of this story. So I stepped away from mainstream comics until somebody said, hey, have you read that comic by Rick Remender called Uncanny X-Force? And I was, and I, you know, I'm friendly with Rick. So I said, no, he did something. And I read it and I was like, holy crap, this is the stuff that made me want to get into comics to begin with. And so I reached out to Rick and I said, hey man, do you want to do another Uncanny X-Force? And he's like, no. <laughs> I'm like, he goes like, I'm doing black science right now. I'm doing, you know, deadly class. I'm doing all of these things that are in IP wise, inherently mine. Why would I want to do more stuff for mainstream comics, which from a practical business standpoint makes the most sense. But I still had a jonesing to say, you know, to, to really work on the things that I loved as a kid, which is X-Men. And so I put that away for a while. And then one day I just like, why can't I just draw that? I mm -hmm. woke up one day and I was like, why can't I just draw that? And so that's what sort of led me into this space. I'm like, I think I can, and I don't have to uh, ask permission. I can just go, go and do it. So this is that, this book is that love letter too. the long winded way of answering you. Beautiful. Yeah. And it's going to be a crowdfunded book too. It is. Yeah. It's five issues. Oh. It's five issues long total about 220 pages. And um, yeah, so we're going to, I think the plan is, and I think this is sustainable. You tell me, I want to get your guys' opinion on it, is that I'm going to crowdfund the first issue, right? Um, um, you know, fulfill that, deliver it, and then crowdfund the second issue and so on and so forth until all five issues have been fulfilled and delivered. Fantastic. Do you think that's do you think that's sustainable? Do you think that's wise? Yeah. When you yeah. when you reached out to me yesterday and you said 220 pages, I thought you were doing 220 pages in one go. And I'm like, no. How do I tell no. him to break it up? Into small issues? <laughs> I had actually spoken to somebody else about that too. I had reached re reached out to um, oh gosh, I, I mean on on top of your guys' success, I was trying to touch base with anybody who had a successful crowdfunding. So everybody from Kickstarter to the one that really straightened me out um, was, was uh, uh, your boy, Zach. Oh, cool. Yeah, I nice. said like, what does this make sense? And with as many red flags and as kind as he possibly could, he's like, don't do that. Don't do 200 pages all at one time, break that thing up, you know? And so again, between your documents, between everybody else who had run a successful Kickstarter, who had run a successful Indiegogo campaign, everybody has been so um, giving with their with their um, experience that I'm like, why am I not going to take advantage of these guys who have these successful camp who've had these successful campaigns? So mm -hmm. if you know, if he hadn't, excuse me, if you hadn't said it, or if he hadn't said it, you would have told me anyway. You know, mm -hmm. like don't do that. Break that up. That makes most sense. You know. Mm -hmm. That's cool, man. Especially when it's it's said from multiple people, uh, you know that it's 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 a probably not the way to go. It's coming from a sound place for sure. Yeah. And um, so, what are, what are we doing on the page now, Eric? I'm in a like this is probably um, a scene that's not going to be. Uh, appreciated by a lot of people who think of like X-Men comics because what they remember is like Wolverine slashing at somebody and killing them or Cyclops blasting them with like concussive yeah. rays. But this is like the, the, the first issue was a good, I'm, I'm working on, what page is this on the second issue? This is page 16 on the second issue. But the first issue was just the introduction to show you like this team of, these teams of superpowered individuals, their roles, their um, relationships with each other, and then ultimately the the hook. Right, like when the when the crowd read when the when the audience reads it, you're like, I get it. These guys are awesome, and uh, yeah, I'll go buy the second issue. Right, the second issue is where we get into the plot. Right, like okay, cool. the the beginning issue is just setting up the plot very lightly. The second issue is when the plot gets really sort of like laid out in front of you of what this what the what these teams are supposed to be doing. Right, um, and most people pay attention to like the big fight scenes, which are super fun to look at, but to be honest with you, not as fun to draw because it's so <laughs> detail intensive. But to me, these are so integral, these sort of like talking scenes, that this is like a typical walk and talk, as I like to call it, like television, mm -hmm. right? Where we're laying out all sorts of exposition so that people know 
th these two characters' relationships with each other. And I think these kinds of pages are really super important to the story, right? Not, not just because um, it catches the audience up to the plot or to the story, but also because it establishes relationships with the characters. And this scene sure. in particular will have a, an eventual impact on issue four. These two, these two characters. Hold on a second. My dog is like having a dream. Natasha, <laughs> knock it off. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, that's really cool, man. And uh, I'm somewhat uh, relieved that that you said that. Somewhat validated, you could say, because uh, I'm have just drawn up the draft for my first comic book renegade yeah. alpha yeah and there's a few scenes in that that i've s naturally put in that are exactly what you're describing walk and talks specifically put there to provide exposition and to establish relationships with characters so yeah. phew, thank goodness that's a thing no it's essential you know and in this scene, in, or these sets of panels in specific, it actually talks about the organization in of itself, right? Like, mm. as you have these kinds of, you know, there's a, there's a awful interrogation slash torture scene before this one, right? And mm. can you imagine two characters walking out of there going like, that's totally fine, it's totally cool, and that's what we need to do, you know? Like, so that yeah. already establishes their sort of like, you know, their comfortability of that concept. But then as far as the organization is concerned, it's different if you have them walk out of there and it's a place that you've seen before. Let's say even if it's a, 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 a super silent or, um, you know, a clandestine organization like, um, like a CIA, if you start seeing hallways, you kind of go, okay, clandestine organization, you know, hallways that kind of look like things that we've seen in, you know, CIA kind of movies. But you can add an extra layer of texture and information of understanding the financing of an organization, the sort of technology level that that organization, yeah. organization has access to. Um, shape language wise, it speaks to them as like, oh, that looks like a giant hypodermic needle that feels uncomfortable and aggressive to me. And so you lay down that subtext for people to sort of like ingest almost you know, mm. subconsciously. And then wow. you go like, oh, okay, I understand those people. I, I, they give, it gives you more texture to understanding who those characters are. Dude, yeah. you've got a massive depth uh, to the amount of knowledge you have on this stuff. I try. Now, that's that could just be all talk. When you guys see this, you're like, oh, that looks like a CIA <laughs> hallway. Yeah. No, this looks so, great. Yeah. I, I was observing it, actually. I can see, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you said that your 9 to 5 is in video games. It is, yep. Yep, and is that what position? A concept artist of some mm -hmm. some kind? Yeah. Okay, I can tell that just by the attention to detail and the way you've designed the backgrounds in each one of these panels. Mm. Uh, it's it's done in an almost flawless manner, and I'm really looking forward to seeing you render this out in ink. It's going to be quite interesting to see how it all comes together, but how important would you say design is within a comic book in regards to the characters and in regards to the environments that they inhabit? Because I don't know that design specifically, at least in the way a concept artist thinks about it, is necessarily considered as much when it comes to comic books, as yeah. much as it would be for video games and movies and other forms sure. of entertainment. Yeah, there's a little bit of holdover. I think like... That's a great question. What's the best way to answer it? Because I think it's it's there's a lot of different components to that, right? Mm -hmm. One is you have to think about sustainability, especially when it comes to comics. For instance, if you uh, you guys have seen like the art of Marvel Universe stuff, like when it comes to like Captain America and stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. I I know a handful of those guys, and they put everything on them. You know, like yeah, there's like a rivet on top of a buckle that's on top of a shield, that's on top of a star, that's on top of I'm like, that's amazing because somebody's going to fabricate that and that's going to be worn practically. And yeah, they're going to make maybe 20 different, you know, iterations of that costume, but then ultimately once it's built, it's it, it exists, right? Mm -hmm. In comics, you can't be that, I don't think you can that be cavalier about detail because you have to draw it over and over and over again. And I think that's why original designs like, you know, Spider-Man and, Dr. Doom and Cyclops and Black Bolt. I'm a Marvel, I'm a Marvel guy. So it's like I look at those characters and I go like, oh, cool. That kind of encapsulates 
and captures who they are as a character just on the designs of their clothing, right? Mm -hmm. You have to think about sustainability because that's not the, like when I, when I see some guy who draws like an ultra detailed costume, I'm like, good luck. That's amazing for page one through five. But when you're at page 50, you are left, you know, yeah. because you, you have to keep drawing that. You, you've set up viewer audience expectation that that's what it looks like. The moment you fall off, because that's the night that you don't feel like drawing, you know, 20 buckles around his neck, people are going to be like, oh, he, he fluffed off in these X amount of right? Mm -hmm. So I think about design that way. But more importantly, I try to think about design as it reflects character, right? Like I need to know, and, and then ultimately like function, right? Like it, yeah. it shouldn't be on there unless it serves to, uh, unless it serves to give you information. So um, the bad, almost laughable version is like Cyclops from the X-Men. He's got goggles, he's got a little line, his name is Cyclops, and that thing is very, very functional. It shoots like little laser beams out of his eyes. But that to me as a design really does capture uh, storytelling information, him as a character, and then ultimately function as far as like what that character design is about, right? Yeah. So you would never add something to a design just because it looks cool? Or do I would, you do that sometimes? I, I do. I'm not guiltless of that. I'm like, oh, that's that's kind of cool. When I pay for it is page 50. Yeah. Right? Like yeah. I would rather have not drawn that little rivet on his head, but I've already drawn it a bunch of times previous. So now I've got to stay consistent, but it yeah. is an active, it is an active sort of like, as I'm um, designing it independent of the page, right. On a, on a separate piece of paper, so to speak, I am mm. clear. I am very clear to myself to be like, I can't draw that over and over again. That looks great on this one image, but the moment I start turning it and here's the other thing, like when I think of design, I try to incorporate elements in the design that give you as a reader, an understanding of where that design is in perspective. And the bad version is, you know, the, you know, the circle on Iron Man's chest, the original Iron Man's chest, even the triangle. Mm -hmm. Why that's so effective is it looks, you know, you understand it that it's a circle, a disc on his chest, but the moment he starts moving around in perspective, like you, you draw him, that circle is actually very helpful to understand how the perspective works on his body. Right, so you understand the moment the ellipse changes, it sort of becomes narrow or even wider. It shifts this way, left or right. You have an understanding of where the plane is of his chest as it's helped defined by that circle. You know. Wow. So I try to think of elements like that to put it onto their body and go like, okay, if I turn him this way, um, yeah, you'll know that that's you know that helps to exemplify or to help highlight that his chest is facing or the plane of the chest is facing away from us. So little things mm. like that. <laughs> Yeah. I feel like we should let Eric get to work, Clayton. Oh, no, that's okay. That's all right. Yeah, I know, right? I uh, we, we could just ask him questions and listen to him talk please, all day. Please do. I, I don't mind. It's going to be a true. great challenge to be uh, to draw while we're chit-chatting. I'm going to move him up there so I cover my own face with the comments. Uh, Mr. Rothy T, T1 says this man is awesome. Donald Thank Delay you. says the compositions on this page are fantastic. Thanks, uh, they are. Nice Johnny Cage says, I can't hear the name Renegade Alpha without thinking about all those self-improvement books anymore. <laughs> <laughs> How far along are you on that script, Clint? Uh, well, I've actually finished drafting it up, uh, the yeah. first issue. And I have a vague idea, actually. Uh, I came up with a few ideas the other day for it that I have to write down. Uh, yeah. Some plots and conspiracies that take place in the book. I love how a story unfolds and grows on itself, like some crazy living organism inside your brain as a creator. Sure. It's sure. it's one of the coolest experiences ever. Yeah. Um, and the way I went about it is not in the way you might expect. I I kind of approached it in a very um, Less as a writer and more as an artist, sure. I decided to just start out with drafting page one and I let the story build upon itself and write itself with every page that came there on after. Right. And uh, I know that there are times um, where you'll hear people say that's a very dangerous way of working. And I mm -hmm. agree, which is why I kept it very loose drafts, just layouts. 
So yeah. I could change things up, switch pages in and out, almost like when you've got the uh, the post-it notes, the, yep. the the storyboard panels when you're doing mm -hmm. up a movie, right? You mm -hmm. can kind of move them around and, and switch ones in for others. And so that's how I approached it. And I found that that was a very rewarding way of creating a comic book for me. I was okay. able to, because for me, the, the story doesn't just end at the text on the page. It's also about the composition. It's it's about the placement of the characters and how much room and, and space sure. they take up in every window. And I could write that down in a script, but I'm not going to be thinking of it or remembering it in the way that I initially imagined it would be when I go back to that script later on and decide to actually draw it. And so, yeah, yeah that's that's why I approached it in the way I did. And it, awesome. it was amazing to, to work in that way. Right. Your, your layouts are actually really good too. Like I know I only saw okay. versions of them, but I could tell the way it was laid out looks looks really interesting. Um, can you can you mod Danger Vanessa? For some reason, all our mods are not in chat today, and I'm I'm trying to link at things for people, but uh, you know yeah, I've, sure. I'm falling behind. How's the, how's your YouTube channel been doing, man? How's how's your community? been as you've built out you know how to draw comics how's that been for you uh me um yeah. sorry say that question again i was i was about to mod vanessa and uh, my That's attention okay. was split yeah i was saying like how's the how's the community growth been for you as far as like mm -hmm. you started streaming how long ago and how's the momentum been and as far as like building your audience obviously you you guys have you have regulars that are on whenever i'm watching there's there's a, a group of usual suspects that are on chat with you, which is awesome, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, man, it's it's really, really cool. Uh, How to Draw Comics began back in 2014, maybe even the end of 2013. So it's been around for a little while. Uh, it started out with the website, then the YouTube channel was created, of course. And back then it was just pre-recorded tutorials mm -hmm. and uh, and that's really what started bringing in the subscribers just addressing issues and problems that i knew other artists just like myself would have been facing starting out down this road that uh, we love so dearly sure. and so i tried to help them out where i could and yeah. so even though i wasn't the best artist i hoped that there would be something maybe that i could offer that uh, someone just starting out could pick up and and find some use in right. and right. and so that's how it began. And this year I started streaming with Rob. He eventually talked me into it. That's Again, this guy he, he pushes me. He pushes me beyond my comfort zone yeah. in, yeah. into arenas that I'm very nervous about at first. But then. I dip my, my little toe in, and before you know it, I, I'm neck deep in the, in this streaming thing. Yeah. And I've been really enjoying it. I, I think it's great. Uh, we're, we're always experimenting with content. And, again, it's thanks to Rob that we do experiment so much because if it was me, we'd be doing the same thing week right. in and week out. I'm a right, really right. big fan of consistency. Uh, I like same. to know what's happening next. I like that predictability. I think um, when you do the same thing over and over again, though, you go insane, especially with streaming. Like Rob does anyway. Uh, <laughs> so, so, you know, we've gone through a bunch of ideas. Um, and, and over that time, uh, of course, the YouTube channel has continued to grow. No doubt, uh, thanks to those streams i think that we have managed to bring in a new audience beyond just the the typical htdc audience because most people find us through youtube search algorithm right so for right. example they might search for something like how to draw beards and right. they'll find my beards tutorial in do you really have a beard tutorial holy crap. yeah I do. it, it went for great. like three hours it's crazy and uh, for some reason, it's pretty popular. Um, oh, but sweet. but I hate it. I hate the video. I feel like I'm rambling so much because yeah. it's all real time. Anyway, well, you think you're rambling? Holy moly! 
so so you know the the search algorithm for youtube is really useful and uh the the streams however don't work as well for youtube's algorithm right. and so the real advantage to doing streams is that you're interactive live with your audience and there's a certain amount of hopefully regularity with uh, in these streams and when you decide to go live so that you've got the same people tuning in who have become fans of your stream each and every right. week or day right. when at the time you decide to do them yeah and uh and so we have gotten subscribers that way but i i think that they probably come from other places probably other areas from my social media beyond just youtube That's places right. like twitter that's and at the various Twitter groups that I'm a part of. So that's been really awesome. And now uh, we've been talking about taking the streams over to a, a new channel, actually, at least some of oh. them, okay. um, just to split up the audience a little bit and, and to aim the content that we're creating specifically at those audiences. Rather, th because sometimes what we've found is that people coming to HTDC have a certain expectation of what they're going right. to be seeing. Right. And some of the streams we do uh, a little bit of a surprise in comparison to those expectations. Right. So right. We, we decided to, to make a Barton Bro Studios channel specifically for that the more so awesome. loose streams, uh, you could say, and, and keep the how to draw stuff for how to draw comics, which makes right. a lot of sense, of course. Right. That is awesome, dude. Yeah, it's Thank been enjoyable. Uh, my personal benefit from streaming is that it's really helped me to come out of my shell a little bit, uh, to show uh, a part of myself that usually is reserved for friends and, and family. And uh, and it's, it's helped me to express. And, you know, I'm an introvert, probably like almost every other artist and creative sure. person out sure. there. So I think doing these streams, uh, especially if you're somebody like me, uh, who does find it difficult to express themselves at the best of times, I can find a lot of benefit, a lot of self-development in doing them on There's a regular been, basis. Lots of positive things, though, too. Like, we've built relationships with so many different artists and creators just doing this training, yeah. which has been right. amazing. I was going to say, like, I've never, like, you guys have had such a, what feels like such great organic and, um, and uh, genuine relationships with anybody that you guys have brought on, you know, and it's, and it's, there's, there's been regulars, but obviously there's been, um, you know, from time to time, I'll see a, a revolving door of, of guests that just sit in with you guys. And that, that feels so good, you know, like you, you guys just mm. feel so comfortable with the, with the personnel that you bring on. Yeah. yeah thanks, man. Yeah. It's, it's really cool. I think it's because, um, you know, we, we try to be as real as possible, and I think that we're genuinely curious about the people that we're bringing on. We, we mm. want to get to know them and and find out more about what they do and, and why they do what they do, especially, you know, an artist like yourself, Eric, who is actually working on a comic book and has this um, amazing ability to, to whip out artwork at the speed that you do. <laughs> I have a billion questions for you. And it's yeah. amazing that we can sit down here and actually discuss some of those uh, some of those questions, and and just to not only get to know you as an artist, but get to know you as a person. Talk sure. a little bit about you know, your work ethic, which I also admire. Uh, you know, all of that stuff is amazing, yeah, and I think that the audience sees that that genuine curiosity we've got for our guests, and uh, and it does it enables them to connect with us a little bit. Right. Right. That's wonderful. Yeah. I like the fact too, that we will have pretty much anyone on like, you know, if, if someone we're not closed off to anyone. Yeah. 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 If they're a campaign, they want to, they want to promote or if they're an artist and they want to do some art stuff, fantastic. We'll have them on. And That's I don't great. know about you Clayton, but like we were in lockdown in Melbourne, Eric, for, I think it was like six months. Yeah, I, I would have gone absolutely bonkers if we didn't have this stream to do. Yeah, so that's that's another thing that it sort of helps to fulfill is just so that you don't go crazy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's great. That's great. For Thank sure. goodness for the internet. Yeah, it, it's amazing. Uh, I mean, who would have ever thought that we'd find ourselves 
in a time where we were able to have these what you would only be able to see on really tv right uh, you know what comes to mind when i think about these streams that we do with these incredible artists is uh there was a, a show back that i that i've come across on youtube with rob Liefeld and and jim lee and, and todd yeah, mcfarlane sure. and, and and they'll do demonstrations and i think it was stan lee hosting it mm -hmm. this it kind of reminds me of that in a sense i guess yeah. this is a little bit more uh genuine than that like a lot of that would have been scripted and 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 really on point here yeah. you never know what's going to happen uh, which right, is cool. right 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 well again thank you for having me this has been so much fun so much fun you're yeah, welcome man, you're very it, welcome it's cool, like getting different artists on too just seeing like not necessarily the different styles but the way they think about doing art is really that that really interests me like dan yeah. frag this whole you know unique approach and and Malin is completely different to that he's kind of like just let's get shit done and just right. does it really quickly he doesn't yeah. really go into the theory of the thoughts that much and i'm like that's just really interesting right right i think you know when it comes to people and their their you know um their methodology right um at the end of the day the successful ones are the guys that are like I think like this, I think like this, but at the end of that formula is like, but also I want to just get shit done. Right. <laughs> like, I don't know. If, I don't know too many successful people who can sit, who, who are stay, who stay in that stasis of theory, right. Like successful mm -hmm. people have a tendency to take that theory and put it into applicate or exercise in an application, you know? And I think yeah. in both of the cases that you, uh, both of the individuals that you mentioned, I think they both have that sort of, we can talk about it, up to a certain extent, or we can go get it done, you know, or, and we can go get it done, I should say. Yeah, man. Uh, in fact, they often talk about that in business. The speed of implementation is probably going to be a good measure of your success. Right, right. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Rob looks like Tolton from The Witcher games. Oh, interesting. There you go. <laughs> um, Eric, this is coming along really, really well. I love the energy behind your lines, and these are the final. These are the final inks for the book, mm -hmm. and yet at the same time, you're still keeping them loose enough to to get that gesture behind them, which is really good to see. For me, I got yeah. a major problem. I'm a perfectionist. You know, it it, it <laughs> yeah. takes me forever to lay down a line. And here you are just slapping them down and somehow they're falling in the right order and, and looking as, as cool as they look and there's this beautiful composition you created in the panel. Uh, for a perfectionist like myself, what advice do you have? How do I oh, loosen okay. up and not take myself so seriously? Oh, what is the... I heard somebody answer this. So somebody much smarter and somebody more eloquent answer this. I can't remember how the answer went. So I'm going to have to go with my interpretation of the answer. Okay. Um, for me, there's two versions. One is that I aim for a very good C average. You know what oh, I mean? Yeah. Like, I don't often, like, I'm not the guy that's like, when we're taking a test, I need to have an A plus, you know? I need yeah. to have, as long as I can get by with a C, a passing grade, I'm okay. And if you imagine, I just talked about how this book is going to be like 200 pages long. I don't mm -hmm. have to, this one panel does not encapsulate the body of the work, right? The yeah. 200 pages encapsulates the body of the work. So if this panel isn't actually an A+, plus, I'm okay just as long as it's not complete crap, right? Yeah. I, have to be able to, I have to be able to move on from issue two, page 17, to issue, issue, issue five, page 40. That is, my, that is my motivating goal. And so to that end, and I think this may be applicable to your question, is you have to learn how to forgive yourself. Right? Oh yeah. Because every piece is not going to be, it's not, it's gonna get close to what's in your head depending on how much time you've had behind the board drawing, but it's not going to be exact. And sometimes even on the days when you feel like you're super on, it's not gonna be exact at all. So mm. I have a tendency to go like, does that, I, I come up with the success criteria for that page or for that image, or maybe for a small drawing, I go, does that land my intent? Yeah. Right? Like, am I 
if the idea is that it's an uncomfortable, like in this particular case, is it, it's an uncomfortable silence when uh, this character that's in the foreground says something profound to my, uh, one of the main protagonists and he doesn't like what he's hearing. So he reacts mm -hmm. in such a way. So it's like, there's no dialogue in this panel. So he side glances at him going like, I don't like what you just said, but I know that it's true, you know? Cool. If that, if I land that in the look, in the, in the drawing, then I liberate and forgive myself of like coming up with the most perfect drawing because that's not the exercise, right? That's not the success criteria. The success criteria is land that emotion and land that beat, right? Now, if it didn't, I go back and redraw, you know? And then everything yeah. else starts to fall down as far as priority. Is the rendering correctly? Is the composition, you know, the composition helps obviously with like the subtext, but like, is the, the does that material look like steel and does that material look like leather? And is that consistent with how I've drawn him in the past? Yada, yada, yada. But it all cascades down from that. That's really cool, man. Great Todd, answer. Todd Cannon says, I think Stephen King said something like, amateurs wait for inspiration. Writers get up in the morning and go to work. I like that. That happened. Yeah, that's yeah. validity in that. I uh, think... Sorry, and Indy from Dystopia says, why are there only 46 people watching? There's 54 now, but the point is, take this link, go share it on social media, get more people in here watching Eric work. Hmm. Subscribe and, Thank you. And, and give us a thumbs up too and, and a comment because notification. You, you, look, if you subscribe, you're just going to be seeing more videos like this with killer artists coming on to show us their techniques and give us a little bit of an inside look or behind the curtains peek at how they approach their work. Uh, so if you, if you like that kind of stuff, if that tickles your fancy and you want more of it, this is the channel to subscribe to. Um, yeah, I think I I fool myself a little bit sometimes, Eric. I'll optimize my process, and I have optimized it a lot. Uh, I've really, really sped up. But uh, something will come up, and uh, and that thing sometimes is a newborn baby. Yes. And, <laughs> I don't and, care what plan you have in place to optimize oh, yeah. your work life. That yeah. newborn baby takes precedence over any exactly. other that, you know? Exactly. So all my respect um, to you is what I'm saying, especially newborn, that newborn, like the, the yeah. they, they lovingly refer to it as the, the fourth trimester, right? Yeah. Oh so gosh. true. I mean, it really is. Yeah. It really, really is. Yeah. Uh, uh, I've... Uh, I've been even... You know, I think I experience man blues sometimes, but only because... Um, I'm away from my work. I think yeah. I've realized I have a very unhealthy emotional attachment to my work. You say <laughs> so when unhealthy? I'm un unhealthy because, <laughs> you know, I can't even go on a holiday without feeling like I want to get back to that drawing board. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure you can relate a little bit with that. 100%. Got a uh, question from, from Badger here. Uh, is Eric open for commissions into digital traditional 11 by 17 size, maybe with pencils and inks and marker colors, I'm assuming that's what he's, what he's trying to say. Not at this time. Uh, my, my singular focus is between now and August of September of next year is to get this book done and then mm -hmm. go into my regular, the space that I was in before I was just taking on commissions. I, I really do appreciate the ask. I would love to get to it, but I would rather, in the time that I have, I would rather get this book done and have it out in front of you guys and getting feedback and, you know what I mean, Get just really getting it out there to the public and then go back into doing the individual commission stuff. I'm, I'm hoping there'll be one exception and that will be <laughs> for cover. I'd love to do it. I'd love to do it. As long as I get enough of a lead time, there's opportunities to, like, if you give me a month and a half's worth of, like, heads up, you know, I'll be able to put that into a schedule somewhere. Ah, there you go. There you go. That's hopeful, Rob. Very hopeful. Um, so, yeah, what I was saying is sometimes I, I mistake my optimized uh, process um, and, and the, the advancements I make with that uh, for my process actually still being really slow, but only because things come up. And I, I forget that, oh, wait a second, it's because this came up and, and it took up a, a ton of my time, but that wasn't because I was working slowly. It's just because this thing came up. And so I kind of, yeah. 
I'm sitting there sometimes constantly thinking I've got to find out ways to, to, to take more shortcuts or to, to optimize things even more than what they already are. Right. But I know that if I just was drawing straight for eight hours, could 16 you do it? hours. Could you, still do, could you still sit behind your table for eight hours, 16 hours and draw? Uninterrupted? I, I probably could, man. I, I think that if I was really in, intent on doing that, I, I yeah. think that I probably could. Holy yeah, crap. I mean, my respect to you. You got to be pretty focused, though, because yeah. I don't know, you get into that zone sometimes, Eric, where you forget that time is passing and, yeah. and you look up, and before you know it, three hours have passed in the blink of an eye. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. Yeah. But it is mentally fatiguing sometimes, you know, this, this creativity uh, that we muster up every single day right. that we invoke and so you you've got to give yourself that that mental space those breaks i know that there's a concept artist called feng zhu who yeah. uh, he, he discusses something along these lines where you know he'll try to get his creative stuff done in the first half of the day when he's got the most energy the most mental fortitude oh, that's as as the day goes on he will start to uh he, he will start to become fatigued creatively you know those ideas won't flow as quickly or right. as smoothly as they did at the beginning of the day and so what he'll try to focus on at that point is more just the the technical execution of finalizing and polishing that concept sure um, yeah and that that does make a lot of sense to me um it does yep you know so I think that, uh, you know, one thing I see you doing is working very, very fast. And I'm just blown away right now by the way you are constructing this background. I was wondering how that would look. And here it is uh, coming together <laughs> right in front of me. It I actually uh, was just kicking myself internally because I'd accidentally flattened. And here's the hang up of digital because it would never happen in traditional. I just yeah. accidentally flattened this layer onto this panel that I just worked on with the face, I'd accidentally flattened it onto the pencil layer. And I was like, well, oh, crap, no. I'll, fi I'll fix that later. Oh, no. Is know. it fixable? I hope it's fixable. Oh, I might have to just redraw it, but it's not a big deal. Yeah. Uh, well, that's the thing, right? Because you whip it out so fast. Yeah. Yeah. But I also think in the time that I'm going to take to redraw that, I could be on another panel. But that's yeah. where... That's where that thing that I was talking about earlier, where I'm like, I could kick myself forever about that mistake, but I don't have time. I have to need to move on to the next panel that I can do something about, you know? Yeah. Uh, Squad Colin says, great stuff, gentlemen. Happy to be a new subscriber. Uh, make sure you also subscribe to Eric's channel, uh, Vanessa and Wagoneer, and chuck in the links in chat. So thank you, guys. You're doing, you're doing great work there. Hell, Yeah. Uh, so, Eric, you know, the other thing that uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about is, is just continuing on with this uh, this approach that you have with, with speed and, and getting these panels done. Yeah. Um, the other thing Feng Zhu has said, and also uh, I've heard Mark Silvestri talk about this too, is working faster than you can think. Hmm. Right? What does that mean? And, and, well... It's kind of like, it's almost like the, the faster, you, at least in my experience, what I have found in doing things is the faster I'm working, the more naturally my intuition start to kick in. I don't mm. overthink things as much. All the knowledge that I have garnered over the years, all the experiences mm. I've had, uh, my brain very quickly pulls those files out of the filing cabinet. And oh, interesting uses them with, without me overanalyzing anything. Because I think when you overthink things and you overanalyze, yes. what are you actually doing? You're worrying, right? right? This, right. this mind state of worry starts to set in. Yeah. And when you're in that state, uh, you're second guessing yourself. Sure. And that's where that, that perfectionism comes from. That's what, what sure. brings perfectionism, in my opinion. I guess. And so I think that an artist like yourself who is able to whip out these panels and not think about it too much. When you're doing that, you, all the techniques you're applying and all the methods that are being executed here aren't necessarily consciously thought about. Would I be mm. correct, correct in saying that? 
Was yeah, I, I think that's accurate. I mean, there's something to be said. There's a there's a forgive the the source of this um, concept, but I don't think it's any less relevant. There is a CrossFit coach by the name of Ben Bergeron, and I read his book, and he was talking about how he trains his athletes, right? Cool. And he says on the day of when they're in, in the competition, and in this case, it's the CrossFit Games, right? The biggest sort of like, you know, CrossFit meetup, or at least it was before the COVID wall came down. On the day of the CrossFit Games, his athletes aren't, if he's done his job well, his athletes aren't thinking about technique anymore, right? <laughs> They're just simply executing on the thing that they had been training for, for like X amount of year or X amount of months before the games came around. So what that means is um, by the time they get to the games, everything should come so naturally to them. They are no longer thinking about, well, I need to straighten out my back. I need to get back on my heels. They're simply doing the thing that they've been training for. And so yeah. similarly to this, right? Now I bring that back to this is that when I'm drawing, especially if I've didn't, done a good enough job with the roughs, I'm not really thinking about like, oh, does that does that work in whatever, you know, in whatever broad brush concept. I'm now worried about the line that I'm putting so that it adds to a level of clarity. And that's as far as my brain goes, you know? Sometimes it's, yeah. it becomes problematic because I like, I'll zoom out and I go like, oh, that was dumb. Why didn't I catch that, right? But that speaks to me not doing enough front end work, right? The training, which means that's the, that's the pencils, right? I didn't do enough work there so that by the time I'm inking, I'm not thinking about it anymore. Does that make sense? Totally, man. That makes total sense. Yeah. Uh, I, I think for me sometimes, because I'll tend to take the rough sketch and go over it with the inks now as well. Uh, sometimes because of the, the level of rendering that I'm adding in, uh, yeah. there is this this certain amount of uh, mental effort that needs to go into how those tones are reading, whether or not the, sh the shadows and, and oh, the, sure. the shades of rendering are falling across the face or the body in the right oh, sure. kind of way, according to that that lighting context. So, so for me, sometimes the rendering can can really mess with me during that inking stage when I'm supposed yeah. to be just you know executing it without thinking about it. Rendering, if you're not careful, and I'm not saying this to you, I'm saying like in general, yeah. rendering, yeah. if you're not careful, is just a time killer, you know? Like yeah. I always think, I think of rendering as informational, right? And this is not the only way to think about rendering, but it's the way I think of it, right? Whereas like when I render something, it better be adding a, a level of information that would not exist if I didn't put it there to begin with, right? Mm -hmm. Whether or not it's addressing volume whether or not it's just uh, addressing you know perspective or like depth it better add to that otherwise i am more off to leave it out I, i'd rather leave it out because yeah. the 20 lines that it would take me to make that really perfect face because i saw some other artists do it and i'm all like ah, the i like i call it like the morse code rendering where somebody goes like dash dot dash yeah <laughs> like i love that seeing when somebody else does it especially in a in a in a masterful hand but i can't bring myself to do it because i just counted how many dash dots that was i'm like that's background lines i could be putting on the onto the next panel you know yeah so it's wow. like, unless it serves unless it serves a purpose of information right i leave it off yeah gotcha do you, do you think about how you want your work to ultimately look in the end? Because for me, if I see that in somebody else's artwork, that that kind of rendering, I want to see it in mine. And if I right. see it in mine, I know that I'll like my work better. Yeah. But then I, I guess there's something to be said about just creating something on the page and not necessarily thinking about the end result, just being engaged in the act of doing it. Yeah, I mean, you're. I think you're talking. You may be talking about two different things, right? There's okay. ultimate. Like, I always try to partition time for experimentation and growth, and like finding opportunities for addition to expand on the mental rolodex of my body of work. Like, oh, I've never done that dashed out stuff. Before. I can't find myself doing that while in the. I'm in the middle of production. Because yeah. it would be it would be inefficient, and I wouldn't do it well, right? I'd just be implementing gotcha. it, not knowing the rules behind it, right? I'd I'd see somebody else doing it. And I think that's a that's a really 
diff that's a really key factor to people incorporating nuance to their work is not necessarily just the how, but the why behind it, right? Absolutely. People, man. people often go like, that's how you draw that perfect crosshatch, but you don't know why why that person that who, who's influenced you took that from. You don't know mm -hmm. why they're doing it, right? So it Absolutely. may look right when you do it because you understand the how, but it doesn't look right in context to the image because you didn't under, you never grasped what the why was, right? And so mm -hmm. that's the time that I partitioned for myself is to be like, that's awesome, the dash dot, the Morse code, but I don't know why to be doing that. I don't know why they're doing it, you know? Yeah. So I would gotcha. take time to do it in the middle of in the middle of a production. I it's rare that I'll do something that I haven't done before, you know. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, I have a friend, um, you know, do you know Mateo Scalera? Do you know his work? Mm, no, unfortunately. Mateo does black science for um, black science oh. for Rick Remender, and he just got through finishing. Um, he just got through finishing uh, Batman Black and White, but the Harley version. So it's like Batman. It's Harley Black, White, and Red. It just came out oh. from DC. Yeah, and people are like, "Oh my gosh, look at the growth that he's doing in all of these ink washed pages!" Right? What you don't see is the hours that Mateo spent behind the scenes developing that look, mm -hmm. you know? And sometimes on the page, he'll experiment and be like, oh, I'll try like a, uh, you know, a opaque white splatter here for a tiny bit of, of, of texture, but it's rare. He's done all of that work behind the scenes so that by the time he's on the project, similar to that athlete to coach analogy, he yeah. is on, you know what I mean? He is at his prime and he is competing at that. He is drawing at that very, very elevated high level. Totally, man. For sure. Yeah. For sure. It's, it's really interesting. I think it, it, it just comes down so much sometimes to what your artwork is and, and what you want it to ultimately be in the end when, when sure. all is said and done. And I think that if you want really detailed artwork with lots and lots of Morse code cross hatching, you got to understand that it's going to take you longer to do that yeah. than to not have it. Right. Um, and, and, right. and so there is a there is a time tax that you've got to pay depending on the the particular style that you're going with. And mm -hmm. I think that you've really come up with a very uh, smart and effective approach to your art, Eric. That allows you to create the illusion of lots of detail within a very short amount of time. Right. And, uh, and that's a hard balance, man. That's really, I, really hard to capture. It's interesting that you bring that up because I just had a conversation. Who was it? Somebody recently, and I can't, dang, I can't remember who it was, but the point of the conversation was, why is it that mainstream comics, because I'm trying to get back into it. I'm trying to like read more mainstream, understand where the mainstream trajectory has what's turned into and where it could you know, be predictive about where it could be going. But we were talking about art and we were talking about how some of our, uh, using Jim Lee as an example, who's, who's like very high on my back in the day influence list, right? Like Jim cranked out images on a monthly basis. You know, that was almost a, not just as a, as a, as an artist, but as a professional working in the industry, that was a prerequisite. Whenever yeah. I showed my portfolio around, one of the questions that would ask me was, well, how fast can you do a page, right? Because they had a standard. And I don't know if people are maintaining that standard anymore. Mm -hmm. One of the, you know, one drawing a monthly book that is, right? Like, I don't know if people can keep up with that. And, I'm, and so we were asking like, why isn't that a prerequisite? When it was back in the day, is it because they're valuing this this time tax version of art as you say clayton right or mm. because they know if the guy puts in that much work it moves so many more units but that doesn't make any sense to me either because jim given the same exact time back in the day still moved as many units as most people who don't do a monthly book nowadays mm. it can be argued that a level of consistency in art on the monthly basis has a tendency to stabilize an audience as opposed to you know um degrade it you know, absolutely, but, man. So it's strange that people haven't found a way to be like, I got to, I got to do a style that's sustainable month in and month out, and maybe a break after six or seven issues, so that the artists don't don't you know burn out too quickly. But I don't know if too many people have that staying power anymore on on monthly books. You know, mm, man, that's that's a really interesting observation. So you said you're reading more comic books from the mainstream at the moment. Yeah. You know, what, what are you noticing within the art style? Because I don't know if it's just me and the comic mm. books that I'm 
picking up off the shelf when I walk into a comic book store. But I look at the artwork, and DC definitely had some killer artists on some of their books. Like I was like, okay, the detail in that, David Finch level, yeah. really, really great. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Um, you know, a, a lot of the stuff, especially maybe coming out of Marvel, is is very simplified. Some mm -hmm. of it's very experimental, and mm -hmm. and I hate to use the word basic, but that's the the best way to describe some of it. Yeah. And, and I always go, man, there's, there's some amazing artists out there, even in the How to Draw Comics group, that these big companies could be hiring. And, sure. and are you noticing the same thing, or is that just coincidentally the, the books that I'm picking up and flipping through at the comic book shop? I'll be perfectly honest with you. I've picked up maybe three recent mainstream books. And again, because I'm so, I'm such an old school Marvel zombie that those, I, it's Marvel centric more than anything, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, I just picked up the this X of Swords thing, which is heartbreaking for me to to try to read through because it's such a slog, you know. It's such oh. it's so like laborious to to uh, like it's an adventure comic, but it was so laborious to like sit there and be excited about it, you know. Oh. Um, but that first issue of X of Swords, where they in, I think it's Pepe Larraz, he's a, he's an amazing draftsman. Okay, um, but he he draws more from Stuart Eminen's work, which is like this nice, clean, concise line. I have a, a high level of respect for it. And I don't know if yes. you believe in this, but like simplifying work is almost more daunting than complicating work, you know? It can be, yeah. Because you can't hide anything behind a simplified line. Yes. You know, you can't you like- lines. Right, right. You're there and now everybody is just judging, oh, did you fulfill that volume? the the you know the cylindrical nature of that leg with like four lines whereas somebody who could be a bit more rendery would need you know x amount more lines you know totally man that's a good so, point so i don't know if they're doing that style going back to our previous conversation i don't know if they're doing that style because they understand sustainability right like they mm. need to keep doing it over and over and over again and adding more rendering isn't necessarily adding more value it's just adding more rendering and it could be something that they could be putting towards the next image that they're doing mm. or if marvel and its editorial staff have sort of glommed onto that look you know and saying mm. like that's representative of us moving forward you know because totally. stuart Eminem is such a high caliber artist people who kind of draw like him i have a, a you know as an editor i like stuart's work this guy is kind of emulating that i'm going to i'm going to push that forward so there's mm. all sorts of things that i can't begin to account for you know mm. yeah it it really does make me wonder just going back to what you were saying about you know, Jim Lee and, and Mark Silvestri and, and, and those dudes back in the day who did have the, the high intensity detail and rendering and yeah. were able to smash out a book in a month. Um, you know, it, I, I don't know exactly how long it's taking Marvel to put out books now with, the, right. with their uh, various teams. Right. And I was, I, I had come to the assumption in my mind that the way in which they were managing to put out books more co on a regular schedule was by simplifying the art. Yeah. But I, I don't know. I, I could be completely I, mistaken on that. I'm guessing at this point, you know, what's yeah. facilitating one one artist being hired, one art style being hired over another art yeah, style. You know? Totally. It, it's it's difficult to know, man. Yeah. It, yeah. One of the things that I love about independent books, though, like the one you're creating here, especially from a, an artist like yourself who can get it done in an amazing amount of time. I, I can't believe it, man. I, I'm so glad that you're doing uh, five consecutive issues and then releasing them one by one yeah. uh, through these campaigns because it it makes me feel like when I invest in the first one, uh, I'm, I'm investing in this long term. Right. There is a, a story that will be unfolding here, not just in this issue, but all the other issues to come, and they're already done. So I, I yeah. know that that story is going to come to me. Hey, can I pick your brain about that? Both of you are successful crowdfunders, yeah. right? Imagine, imagine, and this is something I discussed with another friend of mine. They're like, "What? What is the benefit of as a person who can who, who potentially could be contributing to your crowdfund?" And them understanding that all five issues are done 
already, as opposed to that same person understanding, hey, here's a fellow that just needs my help in order to get this book done. Isn't there more initiative for that contribution, right? If they know, hey, they just need my help more than what I'm doing, which is like, hey, it's all 200 pages are done. We just need to get out to get it out the door and into your hands. You know, like those are the things that are bouncing around around in my head. That's interesting. Yeah. I understand what you're saying, but I think like at the end of the day, it comes down to the fact like I want an Eric Kennedy book and that's going to trump everything. Yeah. 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 People, people donate out of pity sometimes, which is, you know, a, a, maybe a, a very strong way of saying that, hey, yes, yeah, some people are going to donate to you just to help you out so that you can get your dream project done. And that's it. Yeah. That's what they get from doing that. Just the right. satisfaction they helped you to fulfill your dream. But there's very few people out there like that. You can't yeah. underestimate uh, selfishness. And that's okay. You know, we're all a little bit selfish. I think it's important to admit and own that. Because when I back your book, man, it, it won't be to help you get it done. It'll be because this book looks awesome and I want it in Thanks. my collection, of course. Thank uh, you so much. You know, so yeah. I I think that's that probably the honest way of looking at it. Okay, okay. And, like, for me too, like, I, I'll back people based on, you know, if their book looks good, but I'll also yeah. back them based on if I like the person. Yeah. Um, yeah. As a backer, you want to have confidence in the creator. And if, if that creator on their campaign is really pressing on the fact throughout that they need your help to get this book done, it it makes it almost feel like the onus is on you to to allow them to be able to get it done. And that mm. if you if they don't get enough backers, so it's not just you then, if you, if they don't get enough backers beyond just you, then this project you might never see. You might never get to hold this book in your hands. And so there's okay. a certain lack of, of confidence almost in a campaign that takes that angle. Whereas someone like yourself, if you're like, hey, guys, I want to present to you this dream project that I've been working on for the last year. I've knocked out five issues. Here is the first one. Right. I hope that you enjoy it whatever else, whatever your pitch is going to be. To me, right. that's like, that inspires a massive amount of confidence in, in what you're offering. Yeah, think- that's that's actually what I, what I was trying, that's the the spirit in by which I wanted to get all five issues done on top of the fact that I don't like being, you know, working on something as a campaign is going, because I just don't know what, what'll happen. You know, I want it done. I want it sitting off in the side and I just, I can just help create more awareness for independent of trying to work on it. Right. But yeah. also it is to sort of build as you, you guys put it perfectly, which is to say like it builds audience uh, or, 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 you know, contributor confidence that, Oh, I, I can get my hands on that book. You know, it's yeah. sitting there. I don't have to wait, you know, X amount of like, I can get it tomorrow. I would see in, in a month or so, however long it takes from printer to, to fulfillment center to me, you know, Exactly. Um, that yeah. was the intent. That was the spirit. But somebody, you know, I, I like listening to different perspectives, you know. So when somebody mentioned to me, hey, doesn't it sort of speak this, doesn't it play this other tune that you may not be paying attention to? And I'm like, huh, having no experience in it. And tomorrow I'm about to be on stream with guys who do it. I'm going to go ask, you know. Hell Michael yeah. Bancroft, uh, sums it up pretty well, I think. He goes, I wouldn't think about that at all. I just look at the book. Does it look cool? Do I think I'll enjoy the story? Is the guy cool? That's all I care about. Right on. That's great. And like, Absolutely. I'm sure you'll get a few people that will complain about it, but you get that with everything in, sure. in life. There's mm-hmm. always someone that's got a problem with something. Right. Mm. I, I think as well, Eric, your openness to learning and uh, seeking out other people's advice with this stuff is just so smart and, and wise of you to do because um you know we come at this sometimes there's a lot of assumptions we think that we know how it's going to be but when you're able to find people who have done it before you and they've done it fairly well and yeah. you know it's not just us that you've talked to it's I mean, people like your boy zach who they they set the table for 
crowdfunding comic books and he was among the first to be very very successful at it right uh, and you have you probably know more now than any one of us know about crowdfunding oh just well, because I, you I wouldn't go out that, to so many people i wouldn't go that far but i would <laughs> say that i i know more now than what i knew six months ago you know yeah and that is profound to me because now um i rarely do i don't I rarely do things um, by being um, data driven. I'd rather be data informed, you know, gotcha. like I would rather make a call knowing that it's a risk based on data that I've heard rather than go in there and be like, okay, this is the exact formula. And I'd want to do, you know, I want to, I want to run the, there's things that I, by way of playbook, I'd obviously want to follow because that makes the most sense. But then sometimes you go, I want to try this whole thing out. And yes, I know about what's informing that, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Eric, I've got a question for you. You said you're, you're looking or you're looking to view, or you've hired a colorist for your book. How is, is that a difficult task for you? Cause your style is very unique. What are you looking <laughs> for? You know, in it's less difficult now that I'm not an asshole. Am I allowed to cut curse on your on your stream? Yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. sure. <laughs> it's it's less difficult now because I'm not an asshole, right? Like back in the day when it came to colorists, I hated everyone, you know, because <laughs> like I had a preconceived notion of what it was. No, that's a lie. I had a preconceived notion of what I thought it was, but when in reality, even if it was the perfect version, it would never be what it would be in my head, right? So I set all my, my collaborators up for failure because I couldn't communicate to them the look and feel of this thing that I'm going for, when ultimately it's not about that. So these days, it's a lot easier for me because one, I vet really hard at the very beginning. I take a look at their body of work and I go like, I think that works, right? But then when they start coloring the page and it's not exactly what I'm thinking of, I ask them what what motivated those things, right? And as soon as I have a better understanding of how they work, and this is ultimately why I believe in the collaborative process, is that once I understand how they work, I try to set them up for the best version of the success by either A, saying, you know, um, oh, that makes a lot of sense to me. You know, this is what I saw, and this is how we can, I think this is a, you're trying to execute this, and I think this is how you can do that better, right? Because it's before I wouldn't be able, I didn't do that because I didn't even know how to communicate it. So now I know that they can do it and I know how to, how to communicate to them like, oh, that's the effect that you're trying to go for, right? Based on what you just told me. Cool. I think this is, if this is what you're looking for, I saw it in these samples that you sent. So do it like this because you can do it already. And they're like, oh yeah, right? And then secondly, and because of my, and I don't know if you guys are the same way, um, I just wasn't big in what I thought would be a, a confrontation. You know what I mean? So like yeah. if I would needed to correct somebody, I'd be like, Oh, I don't know if I should say that to them. I don't know if I could say that nicely, blah, blah, blah. But in this day and age, especially when it comes to a project like this, I am going to extend to you the same level of professional courtesy I would expect from you. Right. Yeah. So part of that professional courtesy is to hold you accountable to the work to your own body of work, right? And so rather than think of it as this sort of like confrontation, I look at it as this is the professional courtesy that I expect out of you, you know? Mm -hmm. So I would expect it from you in as much as you should expect it from me. And then ultimately I'm gonna hold you accountable to the to a bar that I didn't set for you, but you set for yourself, you know? Totally. Like, you didn't get through the door because you sucked. You got in through the door because I really, really like your work and I'm excited to work with you. If you deliver below that and I've come to identify it by objectively pointing things out in the stuff that you show me in, in order to get through the door, then I can say, I'm going to hold you accountable to the thing that got you through the door. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's a great way of looking at it, man. Uh, especially as somebody who uh, feels the same way you do about confrontation. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I really same way. appreciate that. Yeah, man. It's, it's tough. Like you've really got to artfully, uh, sometimes at least I feel I need to, uh, approach a, a situation like that as to, so, so you don't offend anybody, um, that you, you do get across what you want to say objectively, but, uh, 
And even when you do that, sometimes it's it's taken in an emotional manner. Yes. And that emotional yeah. reaction can be difficult to deal with. That's true. Um, but, you know, y- you've got to figure out ways to navigate through business, through those collaborations, um, because that's the reality of, of creating a comic book, especially. Yeah. It's, it's oh, a collaborative yeah. effort unless you're going right. to do everything on your own, which is insane and, and what I'm intending to do. But, I mean, you know, uh, there are definitely books and titles I want to do where I'll hire an entire team of people uh, to do it. And and organizing them and, and coordinating everything is is definitely going to be a whole new form of challenge because then it's it's completely out of your control to an extent. That's what I meant when I was saying, uh, you know, these days I try to be less of an asshole, which yeah. is like, it's an organic process. If I wanted it to be exactly the way I wanted it to be, I'll just do it on my own. But exactly. I understand that I can't. And so I have to allow for that person. I have to set that person up for the best version of creative success. Right. Yeah. And, and find that that what they're delivering is actually the best that they the best that they're delivering even if it doesn't immediately it isn't exactly the thing that i had in my head and that's okay mm-hmm. that has to be okay or otherwise i'll just do it on my uh, by myself you know mm-hmm. if you had the time do you have the skill set to do colors as well i would think so <laughs> color <laughs> is like color is a um i take a very uh simplified approach to color which is like you know, here's the green room and there's a couple of red things inside of it. <laughs> like, I, I wouldn't be able to do it with the same kind of flourish as, oh, we were looking through, my friend and I were looking through color approaches for Arc Athena and we were looking through, shit, we were looking through Ultimates 2, which is like that Brian Hitch book, you know? And the, I think it was either Paul Mounts or Lord, I think it was Paul Mounts. And... I was like, on my best day, I couldn't do what Paul does. On my best day, eat, eating a good breakfast, like, you know, getting sleep the night before. On my best day, on this one panel, on this one double page spread, I couldn't do. I couldn't do this. So, for for the sake of like saying, can I color a comic book the way I need this com- comic book to to be colored? I would say no. I would I would fall. I would fail in that pretty hard. Mm-hmm. But in as far as like coloring a comic book that's in my comfort zone which is not this comic book, I think I could give it a pretty good go. Absolutely, man. Um, And when are you starting your your email sign-up list for Arc Athena? You know what? That's a great question. I was going to throw that back on your side of the court. When is the most ideal time to start the the sort of the sourcing of those emails? Is it right now? Are you going to say right now? Hell wow. yeah, man. <laughs> I would say right now on this stream, because you're showing the comic book and uh, you could even tell people, hey, guys, this isn't coming out until like 2021 or 2022 or whatever. Yeah. But just then. that's seeing- okay. That's all right for people to set up the expectation. This There, there won't be any sort of fatigue there. I mean, I, I don't know, you know. No, I don't. I don't think so, man. I, I think. My philosophy is the sooner that you can get people jumping on board and subscribing to that email list, the better. Because, yeah, maybe there will be some fatigue and and some people will drop off. But hopefully, you know, you're continuing to do these sorts of little inside looks at what's happening with the book. And and you're updating that email list, which is which is getting them just more and more hungry. Right. Uh, You know, it's like your favorite meal. Um, it's it's not like you're you're eating it all in one go. You you have it once a fortnight or whatever, you right, know. And, right. and it's still always going to be your favorite meal. So you, they you will subscribe to that email list and and hopefully, I think if you're sending them an email every single day, they might get fatigued. Right. But uh, once a week, once a fortnight, sending them some kick-ass inside peeks of what's happening with the book or just you know a little write-up as to, to what your thoughts are on it and the direction you're going to take with it yeah. could be something that's really intriguing. You know, I think that's about awesome. all the video games that I'm fans that I'm a fan of and how uh, I, I so wished that Valve had a blog, a development blog of Half-Life mm. or something like that, that that's I could great. follow. Uh, that would be so amazing. But, um, you know, 
uh, video game companies tend to keep all of that stuff very locked down. Right. Uh, so but I understand the spirit of what you're saying, which is like, as a fan of this thing, you you know, little insights here and there uh, yeah. really help to contribute to the momentum of it, right? Yeah, and they, you know, if I'm interested in this book, it makes me feel like I'm a part of that process as you're great. creating it. So I become That's more great. invested. And on That's launch great. day, when that campaign is up and running and it's live, there's no hesitation in my mind at all to back it because I feel like I've been as part of this this creative process as much as you have. That's great. That's super helpful, you guys. One thing you just need to be aware of if you if you're gonna do your thing on Indiegogo, yeah. the sign up the sign up list only lasts six months. So you need okay. to make sure you're, you're getting those names from that document or they or they're gone. You can download the email list from from Indiegogo before that happens. Yeah. And then you can just run it for another six months if you want, or you can set up a third party email list collector, which yeah. You know, it's probably the way to go. Are you creating a website for your your comic book studio or or your individual comic books at all? Those are all valid points, and I have not even thought of it. You see how <laughs> un- ill prepared I am, and no, why I'm so glad stuff, to be on this converse in this conversation to be like, did you think about this? Did you think about this? I'm like, oh no, this it's kind of like planning to go to a to a foreign country, you know? Like, did you bring <laughs> your did you bring your charger? Did you bring the yeah. plug, you know, the little plug converters? Did mm-hmm. you bring, you know, air sickness pills? Did you know that oftentimes it rains over there? So did you bring a jacket or something like that? You know? Like I don't know the check off list. And I think, you know, to 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 another thank you to Rob that um that uh, document is going to be super helpful moving forward, man. But the good thing is you're, you're launching Q3 next year. You're not launching this month and you right. don't get that stuff sorted out. So, like, you've got time to get that stuff all squared away. You'll be for right. Right on. Thanks, man. Yeah, man. You're right on track. Uh, you tell me. You tell me when the cutoff time is for this thing, because I'm sitting here kind of like, I'm still deciding on what the lighting scheme will be for this, so that it helps draw your eye to the center of this screen, right, um, or the center of this panel. And then yeah. I have to also not get too noodly because when the bubbles, obviously, this is a, you know, huge sort of uh, narrative dump in these next couple. Of, that's why there's a lot of dead space on the left hand side of this panel. And yeah. I remember when I drew the sketch for this, why I left a lot of dead space below and partially above. And here I am noodling this, whatever, this throwaway, mecha- this BS mechanism above yeah. them. And it could just as fall, you know, it could just as easily fall under a balloon and it won't even matter, you know? Totally, totally. Well, it's it's interesting, man. Um, talking about that throwaway mechanism do you have any idea what that's supposed to be or are you just like hey you know what here's some shapes on top of other shapes it looks kind of cool uh, <laughs> just add it in there no i wanted the the root the feeling of the room right the subtext of the room is supposed to be the the mechanism right it's supposed to be an engine right okay. so i wanted to, everything to feel like either release valves or pistons or pipes that give you this sense of like are they in a giant engine are they in a, in a chassis somehow because mm-hmm. again it's the 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 machine that helps power this organization and the awful things okay. that they're keeping behind closed doors you know so in in as far as its function is concerned i don't know what it does right <laughs> but in as far as the subtext and the feel that you're supposed to get from it yeah that's by design okay. And I, I love I love that you're you're sharing a little bit of your your thought process behind this stuff. So it's you're thinking broader, not necessarily about specifics, overall feeling, right? And that's right. what you're trying to convey first and foremost. Yeah, um, that's really cool. Do you have reference that you're looking at while you're working this stuff up, or is this no. just coming from from the mind of Eric? Yeah, this this I mean, I was a um, uh, my start in the entertainment industry was as a an environment designer for animation. Mm-hmm. I can so tell. Actually, between, <laughs> thanks, man. Between this and like this, you know, this is the kind of stuff that you kind of these shapes, these this sort of like level of detail, um, and then ultimately this composition. I think like 
this is the kind of stuff that I already ha- I've had built upon in my mental Rolodex from working X amount of years, you know? Mm-hmm. So there's nothing in here that I haven't done before. Right. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, and I'm just employing that again, if that makes any sense. That's really good, man. Eric, whether it's his, got to love that lettering room. Have you hired a, a letterist or do you have one in mind? Because Eric, who, you... who said that? Eric Weathers. Oh, yeah. It's uh, what do you call it? It's Eric Weathers. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's a master letterer. No, no. He's going to be the guy that's going to be doing the letters for Arc Athena. There you ah. go. Man. Yeah. That's really so, cool, man. So, yeah, I, I kind of have, you know, uh, his his unenviable task of like, God, I don't. I hope I don't put Eric in a bad spot of like having to figure out where. Where do you want me to? What do you want me to cover up, man? You know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, Ryan says, "Yo, Eric, straight up killing it as always." Uh, we've got Jim O'Reilly saying, "Eric Kennedy's work rocks." Thank uh, you. Keith Dodson says, "I need to send him the crowdfunding doc." He's got it, man. Loves it. Loves the doc. Loves the doc. Super helpful, man. I'll tell you. Can I ask you about your camera, Eric? Because yeah. that kicks, I think that even beats Eric uh, Eric Weathers' camera. And that's I don't know like, if it's not the same one. What's, what camera does Eric have? This, can you say in chat? But this is, um, crap, it's a camera that my wife bought me, so forgive me. It, oh. is, a, it is a Sony A5100. It's like a low-end mirrorless camera. Oh. But yeah, the thing right. that's making it work is this lens that's on it. So I took out the one that came out, came with it in the box and I put a Sigma, I think this is a 30 millimeter, 1.4. Mm-hmm. And that's what's creating that really nice short, you know, that really shallow depth of field. That's that cool. Seeing, yeah. yeah, and then it's about the lighting, right? Yeah, yeah, and that's the other thing. Like everything that you're seeing in this room doesn't come from like my well-researched brain. I reached out to my friend who streams on Twitch and on, um, and on YouTube, his name is Michael DiNicola. And I touch base with him. I'm like, what am I doing wrong? What can I do to make this thing look semi-decent? And he's like, well, your background looks dead. So put, you know, put something so that that blur, that bokeh kicks in. And so those lights back here, like right sweet. here are all his suggestions. And then this light over here, so like when I start doing streams, I can turn this light on and then all these other ones that are directly in front of my desk on so that it helps illuminate this launching pad that is my desk. That's really cool, man. Yeah. Yeah, you've got a great setup. Um, And you're also very good at articulating what it is you're saying, especially when you're discussing your art. Have you ever thought about uh, creating like a class, uh, whether or not it's for Skillshare or Udemy, I think you'd be pretty good at it. You You could probably make a killing doing that on the side too. Thank you very much. But it's like, you know, I started the YouTube channel and the first things my friend said was something similar to the spirit where you're talking about, which is like teach and tell people and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I'm not the guy, you know, like I, I don't know. I'm not confident enough in the stuff that I'm doing as it pertains to you, you know, like yeah. your particular journey will take you down whatever avenues that it may take. But I think what I have a reaction to is when you go to YouTube and you're like five best tips to blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, yeah. I don't know. I know that's for that, for the sake of the algorithm. And I know there's nothing inherently built into that that says it must be like this, but I have, I'm so turned off by that click baby shit. Yeah, And also personally, as I see my body of work, I'm on that student ride right along with somebody. Mm-hmm. So for me to st- take a step forward and go, I have um, an academic teachable knowledge about process that's applicable to you. I don't think I'm comfortable doing that. Mm. You know? I'd, I'd turn that around a bit and say, okay to think of it more as though you're you're mentoring somebody mm, mm. rather than than coming at it from a, a, an academic like university degree background uh i should say like a learned place you know what i mean yeah, like, okay. i don't know enough to be like here's how you mm. should do it you know dude i would kill to be mentored by you holy shit <laughs> That's kind of like thing, uh but anyway I uh, just thought I'd run it past you. I think don't make my mistake where you're focusing on a bazillion things at once. Focus on your comic book, get it done, and uh, and you'll be sitting 
a okay i think that's great I, actually that's more of an actionable plan for me because mm -hmm. just just setting up the youtube channel just setting up the camera just setting up these lights as i talked to you about that took so much time away from the desk that i know as a as a exercise is a necessary evil because you know how are you going to do a youtube show you guys just the both of you just said hey your camera looks great and that didn't happen by accident so that that hopefully fingers crossed it translates to when i live start live streaming it will have this level of look and feel right oh yeah. um, but to be honest with you i'd rather just draw this dang book you know dude yeah honestly i, th I think that's that's awesome that's a great attitude to have i wish that i just did that as well sometimes but look at look how well it's you know if you have the propensity for it and if you have sort of like a group of people like-minded who are all pushing in the same direction between you and rob and the, the crew that you have that show up on a weekly basis it makes it so much it, it makes it less of a of a task and more of a hangout you know so it's not work anymore it's just like hey here we are, right? And it happens to mm -hmm. fulfill the things that you need in order to like build a community, build up your YouTube channel, build up awareness for your guys' projects and campaigns. That that's that's like that's this level of like organic synergy that I wish I could reach, but it's so early right now, I can't do it. And my natural tendency to be like, forget all that shit. I just want to draw, you know? Yeah. Oh no, it it definitely feels that way, man. It's it's like hanging out. These streams have become kind of addictive uh, mm -hmm. to the point where I'm like, man, I gotta I gotta get back to work here. Right, right, right. Uh, I don't know how you guys partition your time, man? But I respect it so much. <laughs> Everything Shakers asks is Eric gonna start streaming on YouTube instead of Twitch from now on? Yeah, the answer is yes. the The cap of the reach that is Twitch is really um really sh it's really sh um short or shallow depending on how you look at it um and i think that by way of audience base people have a tendency to accept youtube as an extension of like me as a person as an artist or as a brand or however you look at it and it's a lot easier for them to to gain access to that right like but twitch takes so much explaining to people as to what it is you know um mm -hmm. youtube you put the link up people go there and they're watching and they know what it is you know it's like saying toothpaste you know like you know the function of it when you say it and so the link to eric's youtube is in the description and people are chucking it in chat so can everyone just go there and subscribe to it actually I hey, done. thank you so much i appreciate I'll it you guys right now i really appreciate it oh Thank you, thank you. There's about two videos on there now. I'm trying to come up with a, I'm trying to come up with a um, a video schedule that will set up sort of um, a, a a level of expectancy and and I guess consistency, so that you know the algorithm will pick up on it, but more importantly, so that people can expect it at a certain day. Oh, awesome! I can't wait. It's gonna be great. So do you reckon you would have knocked out this page if you weren't streaming with us already? Uh, I would be close. Yeah. I see, you know, there's things on here that I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this environment. And I figured we got on the on the stream at around two-ish, right? We're now going close to four o'clock. At, at four, maybe, you know, a little after, I'm going to kindly and as gracefully excuse myself so I can get to work and trying to finish this page, if you folks don't mind. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Uh, what time was that, did you say? Four o'clock, so that's about 20-ish 20, minutes. Yeah, absolutely, okay. man. That's perfect. Um, and Eric, you have a, just a, a huge social media following. How, how did you manage that, man? man? I remember when you and I first started talking and you were like, Eric, how do you use social media? I'm like, Rob, I don't fucking know. <laughs> you know like, <laughs> I don't know. Like, I, you know, I get, I may get that question once in a blue moon, and uh, for I wish I had the answer. Like, oh yeah, yeah. There's, like, there's all sorts of theories. Like, you know, post at a certain time. Everything that you're hearing about YouTube, you, you can, you know, somehow I apply to Instagram and everywhere else, but I do not have a good answer. That's crazy. I do not have a good answer. I just from and I and I believe that, or I think that you guys believe in this too. Is that 
the best thing that I could have done was just continuously try to post good work, right? And then everything else should, not always, should catch up thereafter. And that's what I had, that's what I had made up my mind for Instagram, which is try to post my process, try to post work, try to do my best one with each, every single time I post and establish a, establish a sort of like a, a personality that is not unlike mine, but obviously at a, at a, at a manageable arm's length, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I just kept it like that. And, and like, more, most importantly, I tried to keep any and all of my like personal thoughts about like politics and all of that stuff as far away from my social media as possible because it's not, it's not, it's more off-putting than anything else, you know. Mm. Do you do you post daily to Instagram? Like, do you sit down for like five minutes a day and go, bam, this is what I'm posting today, or do you schedule out at the start of a week? How do how do you do that? That sounds like a plan, Rob. And you know me, I just said I don't do that. <laughs> I never planned it at all. It was it was it was more like as I was getting things, the thing that really helped me post most consistently back in the before time is when I was doing conventions consistently. So every month I would be at a show, you know? So yeah. the conventions would be there. I would get commissions at conventions. And as I finished those commissions, I would put them up, right? So it would be conducive to always having something new to put up onto onto Instagram, you know? If you fast forward to now um, and you gain X amount of followers, a percentage of those followers never saw the versions before they followed me, right? So now I have a, a library of images that is conceptually evergreen to new followers as I continue, as I repost them, you know? So it makes it, it, it's not as, as critical for me to generate new images because the influx of new followers are seeing these images for the very first time, right? You've got an incredible library on Instagram. I'm scrolling through it now. I still haven't reached the bottom. Like you've obviously been doing this for a while as well. It's overwhelmingly annoying. In my opinion. <laughs> Like sometimes I'll go like, oh yeah, I put that up on my Instagram. I'm like, Jesus is obnoxious. You know, there's so much stuff. Why did I post that? You know? Oh, that's crazy. But to answer your question, no, there was no sort of like every Thursday I'm putting something up. Uh, we've got Art to Bear saying the hawk is uh, Rob the Hawk is coming in nice. Thank you, Art. I don't know what I'm doing it with it at this stage. Uh, Art also says Eric is one of the good guys. Thanks, uh, Art. He's always had, so he, Art's always made time for me at shows. He's never, you know, there's plenty of times when I'm walking, uh, and Art can attest to this, there's plenty of times when I'm just walking through. Do you guys remember that dolly shot that um, Spike Lee does with his movies, where he puts the actor on what feels like a track and then he'll just drag him when he keeps the camera on him, but he's not really moving. So it looks super unnatural. That's me at a convention. Like <laughs> I'm just walking down artist alley and I feel like I'm on a dolly and people are just yanking me through. And once in a great while I'll hear Eric, yeah. and I'll turn and start, you know, and I'm like, Hey, you know, and he'll, he'll always make time, which is great. Uh, I got to ask you, Eric, what's this brush pack you're using? Oh gosh, this is the what pencil is that conversation, right? It's like, what's that ink brush? I don't know. <laughs> I wish I could show it to you. Hold on, I, I will look. See, look, like it has the most. Can you guys see it on screen? It it has the most generic things yeah. that are unidentifiable to you. Um, I hate it. Right, like it's like dry ink one. What is that? Like whose brush set is that from? You know, like. There's some that are that are may key you into whoever yeah. uh, you know whoever Gumroad I bought it from, but this one in specific, the one that I ink, ninety percent of these pages with is literally called Dry Ink One, and I don't think that's helpful. Dry <laughs> Ink One. That's dry hilarious. Ink One. Right. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it, man? A lot of the time, people on the outside are watching you work, and they're like, "What?" what is this guy using what tools has he got at his disposal that allows him to do what it is he does mm-hmm. and the funny thing is the most ironic part of it is it is not the tool that makes the artist 
Right, right. Yeah. It is. Even if you've got these brushes, it's not going to allow you to be able to do what, what Eric does here. It's uh, There's so much more depth to it than that. There's a I lot remember, that goes into it. I remember I went to a um, a workshop for Massive Black. Those guys, you, you spoke earlier oh, about yeah. um, concept artist Clayton. They're and awesome. they had a, yeah, they're amazing. And yeah, unfortunately, they shut down that website, right? But Yeah, I you know. know. What the hell? I think it's just, I think they just, it was difficult for them to maintain. I think it was just time for them to sort of expand and they matured Maybe, yeah. beyond that website. But for whatever reason, I still miss it. Um, they had a, a um, workshop in Los Angeles. And I remember Dave Rapuza, amazing illustrator and concept artist in his own right, right? Like, wow. I remember him doing a demo. Yeah. And he was like, he did a demo. <laughs> and like, you know, when you're using a, a Photoshop brush, you can kind of see the silhouette of the brush shape, right? Everybody, mm -hmm. I think everybody who's used Photoshop is aware of that like, concept. But his brush was like a penis. <laughs> uh, it was literally like an erect penis with like balls at the bottom of it. Was that on purpose? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, yeah. It's to, and it's to your point, which is to say, it doesn't matter what brush I use, you know? Like, yeah. <laughs> I can... I can give you an amazing, you know, piece of concept art that's film production, video game production ready, because ultimately the execution of the thing is not about this brush. It's mm -hmm. about the ideas that I'm going to, you know, uh, highlight with this brush, you know, mm -hmm. but that, when you said that, I was like, that's pretty funny. I remember that Dave Rapuzza story. Where he had the, it, they, everybody in the room called it like the penis brush, you know. That's hilarious, man. Yeah. And I didn't know that Dave Rapuzza was, was a part of Massive Black, actually. No, he was one of the guys that they invited for, uh, um, for the workshop. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Man, those were some of the first ever uh, tutelages that I experienced. Uh, the, the first steps into the digital world that that I was given. And yeah. man, this is such, it, it's funny how you can say that you've got a fond memory of learning from, from a video uh, on the internet. But that, uh, I, I think back to the, the place I was at, at that time. Yeah. And, and the the progress that I made because of those videos, yeah, and uh, and they all will always hold a special place in my heart. I know that for sure. Um, cool. Now, what else was I going? To, I was going to ask you, uh, how long you've been drawing for, and and what got you into it in the first place? Because we kind of skipped over your history a little bit. Oh Eric. yeah, sure. Were you uh, doing? anything before you were doing this or did you just go you know straight from high school into university or maybe straight into the video game industry uh tearing yeah, it up with the that's tablet? a great question um let's see right out of high school this was 93 i wanted to be a comic book artist that's right around the time that image you know the original image books came out and i was like i want to do that for a living nice. and i went to san diego comic-con showing my portfolio and nobody would even, it, if I was on fire, nobody would pee on me to put me out. Like, <laughs> nobody. Because my body of work, do you remember the show called Aeon Flux? Have you, do you remember, yeah, that? I remember that? From yeah. MTV Liquid Television? I loved that show. And because I was stubborn, I knew going into Comic Con that everybody and their mom was trying to try to draw like Jim Lee or Rob Liefeld or Mark Sylvester Todd McFarlane to try to get a job, right? And it was not it, it was natural for them to get hired based on those styles because those guys were just expanding on Absolutely. the expectation of their brand, right? It made total sense. But I did it the hard way, which is like I'm going to draw your characters, but I'm going to draw it in this Aeon Flux style that's not at all marketable, you know, like super skinny and ine like emaciated. Like, yeah, yeah, just super skinny people, just not at all anything that looked like the stuff that they were doing. So I came back from that show having been rejected the entire weekend. It was like three days worth of just people saying, this is nice, but we can't hire you because you don't know, draw like Jim mm -hmm. or Mark or Todd. And so I was like, OK, I guess I got to go to community college, you know, yeah, so I'm right. signing up for like whatever classes were left over and my phone rings and the guy, I said, hello, this is Eric. And he's like, hi, Eric, this is Peter Chung. And Peter Chung has created Aeon Flux. He's the director Whoa. of that show. You're kidding. 
Wow. Um, and so, hi, Peter. This is, you know, this is, or excuse me, hi, Eric. This is Peter Chung. Uh, how are you? I said, fuck you. You're not Peter Chung. And I hung up the phone. No. I, I thought it was my friend Cleveland. And actually, I said it. I said, fuck you, Cleveland. This isn't funny. Something like that, where I dismissively said, fuck you. And I hung up. <laughs> oh, my God. And the phone rings again, like a couple of minutes. And I pick up and I said, hello. And he says, I swear to you, this is not Cleveland. This is Peter Chung. <laughs> Dude, I can't believe this story. This is amazing. And so he said, I'm doing the long form version of Aeon Flux. Would you like to come and work on it? And I said, What? Yeah, absolutely. And so I can't remember how long it took, but from but from the time that he gave that call, I was up in San Francisco and I was working on Aeon Flux as a High, you know, just right out of high school. But before that, I had right. found somebody that was working in the animation industry who was taking on a lot of freelance, uh, environment design freelance, and I ghosted for him for a long time. Right? He needed assistance, cool. so he would show me everything from perspective to like design, Sid Mead, all of these different influences of art and you know concept artists before concept art was a thing. You know, mm. and so I kind of cut my teeth that way. And so by the time the Peter Chung call came, I kind of had a few um, things up my. I, I had practical work experience up my sleeve already, but by the but when I got up there, like all of those guys are rock stars. They're just all so good working in this really small studio, and I still have really great relationships with with uh, a good portion of them. The most notable one is this guy named Robert Valley. Robert mm. Valley is the guy who did. He did the concept or he did the character designs for Tron Uprising from Disney. Oh wow. Cool. Right. So Rob and I go back that far, but Rob is a talented animator, illustrator, storyteller in and of his own right. He can pretty much do anything. And he did that. And so that's how I got my start in animation. And I just kind of like I remember being in San Francisco's um Aeon Flux was about to tie up for the by way of production. They were like, okay, this was eight months, nine months worth of production. We're all done. And I was like, okay, I guess I'm going back to LA. I, I don't know what I'm doing next. And Peter walks over to my desk and he says, hey, have you ever heard of a guy called Glenn Danzig? And I said, no, I don't know who that is. And he goes, well, he, he wants me to draw uh, his he has his new he has this new label coming out called Verotic and he wanted me to draw one of the titles but I don't have time because I'm going to be going into post so he asked me if I knew anyone who kind of drew like me and I recommended him to you so I moved back to LA I met with Danzig I didn't know who he was and all I knew of him was like oh this dude with the glasses and the long black hair looks super emo and muscular you know Later, I come to wow. find out like he's the Glenn Danzig from like the Misfits, but he's a huge comic book nerd, huge, huge, huge comic book nerd. So he puts me on a title, and that's how I got my start doing comics. And then I just kind of bounce back and forth from comics to like animation, you know. And I would do environment designs for a lot of different shows, and I'd come back to comics, do that for a bit, and then go back into animation. So, like animation wise, I worked on like. Justice League of America for Warner Brothers and Teen Titans and like all of those Warner Brothers shows, right? That's insane, man. Yeah. And then working for like, you know, Wildstorm and, you know, all those, the, the you know, on Cybernary for Wildstorm and then picking up freelance here and there for DC and Marvel, but nothing Cybernary. really like that. Cool. Yeah. It, it must have been amazing to walk straight out of high school and score like your dream job. Because you loved Aeon Flux, and then I did. I here did. you were working on Aeon Flux as soon as you got out <laughs> of high school. What the hell? I think I, I I look. I mean, if I could time travel back to my younger, I would totally kick my own ass because I was so arrogant at that age. You know, like right out of high school, you're working in the animation industry. You know, like no. Like, no, I didn't, I wasn't humble about it at all. No, like, just no self-awareness. I would go back and just punch myself directly in the face and say, calm down, work <laughs> on your craft, 
look at everybody in like rather than going like whoa there's a lot of great people in this place maybe i can learn from these guys my jerk attitude was like look how cool i am i'm with all these good people and blah 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 like these guys are ultra marathon runner athlete types wow. and i couldn't go two miles you know but i pretended i was good because i think it was a coping mechanism for that fear and intimidation you yeah know? So, I don't know. I would I would totally punch myself in the face if I could go back. Just calm down. Learn as much as you can from these guys. This is free education that you're about to get, you know? I uh, got Sheldon Martin for five dollars. Question for Eric. Uh, how are you breaking down these issues? Quick outline thumbnails. Oh script. yeah. So I um <laughs> if I were to show you this script for Arc Athena, it I, it's embarrassing because Everything is in beats, right? Like I need this to happen, like old Marvel scripts. I need this to happen, this to happen, this to happen, this to happen, right? And then I just draw the thumbnails based on what I what I believe those um, beats, those um, bullet points represent. And then from there, like they're all, I could show them to you. I think they're on this iPad. Awesome. That's really cool. Where are they? Hmm. Well, they're, they're, they're in smaller thumbnails. And then like, I take those thumbnails and then blow them up to the images that you have, or like I redraw the roughs that look like this, right, based on those thumbnails, and then get to the process of inking. Does that, so does that, cool. does that answer the question? Sorry, if I missed the yep. person gave good money. Mm -hmm. Nice. Can't wait to read this book. We've got uh, just under five minutes left. Is there anything that you want to talk about, Eric, or are there any questions from the chat uh, that that desperately need to be, you know, asked and answered? <laughs> I would love to answer questions. I mean, I I, I think I, I kind of ended up burning our time together by asking you guys so many questions about the whole process. Forgive me if uh, oh, that not was at all. the intent of the, the stream, you know? I'm more curious about your guys's experience, your guys's processes, more because my shit's boring, right? I deal with it every day. So I was like, what do these guys do, man? You know, mm -hmm. how do they get into the spaces that they're in? We got a question from Ballandor. A uh, question for the Master Kennedy. How did the name Arc Athena come to be? It's actually a, <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a tongue in cheek joke to uh, Wildcats. You guys remember that from the nineties, right? Oh, like, yeah, man. It, it, like if you if you like wild C A T S is like covert action teams. I'm like, I don't know what that means, you know. Like as long as it made this cool thing that had a conjunction near the end, and so Arc yeah. Athena A R C used to stand for something, and I was like, this is hilarious, you know, because I'm paying homage. And uh, again, as a love letter to those that era of comics, mm -hmm. I tried to make it mean something, but then like I can't for the life of me remember what it means. So I'm just like, forget it. I'm just gonna call it Arc Athena. Right? That's hilarious. Um, and it's also a play on. I think I have the Young Blood issue here. Yeah, like Young Blood was always two issues. One is, one is y the Young Blood um, comic, and on the other side was Team Young Blood. Do you guys remember that at all? It was always it was a team book. So one side would be the regular yeah. the regular series, and the other side would be the B team or like the alternate team or whatever. Awesome. And, Ar and Arc Athena is representative of just one of the two teams that's inside this book, right? Cool. So good. Um, Corey asks, ask him if he freestyles his perspective. The answer is yes. Please do not, with a magnifying glass, try to like put this thing into like a uh you know a, a horizon line and a vanishing point because it's embarrassing how quickly this stuff falls apart but to that point i am i'm not trying to capture the the correctness of something i'm trying to capture the sort of like believable space right like if i wanted to do an architectural drawing of something which i used to have to do for environment designs and animation that thing needed to be spot on because you know, my art director was like an architect. So he was, he was a stickler for, you know, exactness. Right. And the mm -hmm. further is when, it, but I switch my brain over to comic book version and I go like, is the space believable? Right. And is there enough information for you to understand 
how that space works. Now, when I used to say that, when I would do workshops at like different schools, like um, SCAD, which is a, an illustration school here in the United States. When I would say that, it, it, I was like, oh, that's really irresponsible because what I'm saying is that you should still know the foundational concepts of what makes perspective works or what makes a space believable as it stands to the very strict regimented concept of like vanishing points and three point perspective and yada, yada, yada. Once you have a grasp of that, only then can you break it in spite of that. And you can go outside in spite of that perspective and still somehow break it and still have somehow make it work. What I think people have a tendency to do is skip that foundational understanding and go immediately into like, oh, this is how this wall works. And this is how, you know, it, this is a parallel room, but this wall is completely going off in a completely different space. You know what I mean? So I think they don't have an understanding of the fundamentals of perspective before they start breaking the rules of it. And that's when I can go like, oh, that's off. But then they'll throw it right back in my face. I'm like, well, your room is off. I'm like, yeah, you're right. Yes, I fake the perspective. <laughs> uh, everything Shiva says, I think Todd McFarlane said he might not draw the most accurate trash can, but he draws the coolest looking trash can. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna disagree with a guy who has that level of success, you know? Like say whatever you want, Todd. I'm on board. You're dr you you are the train conductor, I'm in the back somewhere, you know. <laughs> I'll go on the trip with you. Awesome. Well, uh we're almost ready to wrap up here, Rob. Uh, and and Eric, is there anything else, Rob, that you would like to announce before we take off? Is there just something I should be announcing? I don't know. Is there you, is something you want to talk about? Yes, oh. this this back and forth is what I really <laughs> appreciate. Whenever I'm whenever I'm lurking in your guys' chat, this is great. We, Thank we, you, to you both. Thank you so much. This is amazing. Good luck and congratulations on the success of you guys' campaigns. That has you. been a, both of you guys have been a, an incredible inspiration to me and also such a, I think, it's just a resource, just such a great resource to be able to be on your stream, Rob, for that document and obviously being able to tap you on the shoulder once in a while and go like, does this make sense? You know? So oh, thank yeah. you for your support and thank you for sort of like the, the, um, unintentional kick in the butt anytime that I see your guys' uh, campaigns. Thank you for all of that. You're welcome. Uh, and thanks for coming on. We'll have to come yep. have you on again. Uh, but you, you sound like you're a very, very busy man. <laughs> I try to because, like, if I don't, I just, like, I fall asleep. My brain just can't deal with, like, that dead time. So idle hands, as they say. Mm. Well, thanks for joining us today, you, man. man. Really, really, really Thank appreciate it. Thank everybody in chat. Thank you so much. You guys are amazing. Um, yeah, well, Rob, we had a couple of things for a couple of minutes, Eric. So if you want to, if you want to bounce out, feel free. I know you want to. Thank you oh. so much. You guys have a wonderful, what time is it? Your time now? I was about to say uh, afternoon. Just going 11, 11 a.m. Okay. You guys have a wonderful morning. Enjoy the rest of your day. See you guys no later. See ya. Right. See you later, Eric. Thanks again, man. How good was he, dude? He was fantastic. He, he was fabulous. Eric. Amazingly talented man and so gracious of him to give us his time today and draw live on the stream. So right. like so articulate and the, the way he thinks about things is, is very interesting. Is this what you're referring to? I went straight over. Yeah, I mean, let's let's get up some Replicator 3. Let's get up some Kozor. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, 420 backers. We have five days left. Uh, we're just... Just over two thousand dollars away from the next stretch goal. That will make it not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, not six, but seven stretch goals. Seven I'll pieces. Be back in a minute, man. Six pieces of art. Uh, you know, and a bonus for the art team. You know, and we start Replicator Four in, in about a month. Uh, so yeah, it, it's going really well. Uh, I'm thinking of adding a couple of. Uh, different perks on maybe some fun ones relating to my hair um we'll see we'll see i don't know what people people seem to be digging the mohawk uh whether it's just to, to make fun of me or if they actually think it suits me I, I don't know but it might be related to that uh but yeah if you haven't if you haven't seen this before you can get all three issues for for 45 us dollars uh, comes bagged boarded gemini like mailer uh with tracking 
uh, and it has covers by Kane and White, Aaron Alfici, and Clayton Barton. So, uh, you know, like top quality art, as you can see here as we scroll through. Uh, so Dario says, uh, next stretch goal, I want that nose pierced. Hmm, jeez. Uh, Colour the Hawk is popular. Colour the Hawk, wow. God, my wife would kill me if I did that. I mean, she wouldn't really, but she'd be like, why are you doing that? And then I'd have to answer it. And then it would start a whole thing of why I have to do it. You, you know what I'm saying? You, you know what I'm saying? You, you all understand. You all understand relationships. Uh, we have that one. Also, check out Eric's Instagram. Oh, my God. Like, I was scrolling for a good five minutes. Like, you can see this here. Like, look, look at this go. He is incredible, man. Like, let's have a look at this. Look at that. Fantastic. Uh, links. Stop stammering, says Poland. Mate, it, it is what it is. I, I can't change me. You, you get what you get. Uh, and I'll bring up Kozor, another fantastic project by the Barton brothers, uh, Corey and... Clayton. Oh, they've got a bump. An additional backer has jumped on board. 26 uh, 369. So they are actually already losing to me. Uh, it is what it is. You know, it's hard to stop the replicator train once it's left the building. Uh, but yeah, great, great first effort for the guys. You know, hockey saying, straighten the hawk. The hawk does what the hawk wants to do. I can't, I can't change it to make it to fit to society's wishes. Uh, but, yeah, this is incredible. Uh, Eric Kennedy has backed both Replicator and Kozor. So, I mean, if you needed some sort of endorsement, I mean, why not an epic, legendary artist like Eric? Uh, anything to say about this one, Clayton? Man, just, you know, we're chugging it on Kozor. Uh, you guys seen the stream yesterday where Corey was – working hard on the the layouts that I actually did up, inking over the top of them, creating mm. a beautiful, splendid-looking page uh, that is drill-worthy. You know, we want to make your eyeballs happy. That's our aim with Kozor, and uh, I think that Corey achieves it with the, the beautiful and, and intricately crafted artwork that he has uh, demonstrated, not just on the cover, his variant cover at least, but also the interiors uh, throughout the book. It's definitely worth your while to invest in this story because Corey has a lot of issues planned for Kozor. Many, many volumes. Corey does have a lot of issues. <laughs> he does indeed. <laughs> so uh, you got uh, a bump screen. You're, you're up for another backer. Oh, great! That's fantastic. Yeah, fantastic. Four forty-eight. This is just the beginning for Kozor, guys. Um, and, and we're really looking forward to, to taking it to the epitome of what it possibly can be with you guys along for the ride. So we want to thank everybody who has jumped on board thus far, everybody who will, and um, and we're looking forward to fulfilling uh, next year. It's going and to be Sheldon, awesome. Sheldon Martin, uh, thank you. Just back both today. What a legend. Thanks so uh, much, Sheldon. Really do appreciate that. And on, on Monday... We're going to have the replicator closed stream. It's going to be a doozy. It's going to be a long one. It's going to be probably eight hours plus, maybe even 12. Clayton will be in and out, but we'll have some people helping us out through the day, which will be heaps of fun. And huge thank you to chat. You guys were on fire today. Uh, it was really cool seeing everyone loving Eric and all the questions that they had for him. And uh Danger Vanessa for being a sensational mod. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you, Danger Vanessa. Uh, and the the other thing as well, just to, to mention it again, is we are starting a new channel for Barton Bros Studios that's going to have the more uh, loose streams on there, mm -hmm. uh, you know, which uh, are going to be crazy. You know, some crazy things are said. Some controversial topics are brought up, and I think um, it's, it's good to – to know for people that when they go to the Barton Bro Studio YouTube channel, that's that's what they're in for. That's what they can expect. When they come to How to Draw Comics, they can expect to get educated on the art of comic book illustration. And, uh, and yeah, we'll let you know when that is all set up and ready to roll. 
Uh, hockey says Monday for us. It's actually Monday for them and Tuesday for us, mate. Um, so that's when it would be. Cool. Dude, that was a that was an absolute cracker of a stream. I really enjoyed that. Absolutely, man. Let's wrap it up here. Uh, thanks so much, chat, for joining us today. We truly do appreciate it. Thank you, Rob, for organizing this stream and being here with us as well. Until next time, keep on drawing, keep on creating, and we'll see you in the next stream. Oh, Bye -bye. and one more one more thing before we press the button. Uh, you don't have to back Replicator and, or Kozor. Just back something. I mean, if it is Replicator or Kozor, that's great, but just back something. Bye, guys. <laughs>